We talked about this first service. I'm going to talk about it again. Uh, how many valedictorians in the house? If that's you, stand up. If you were a valedictorian, stand up. We got two. I don't believe the two of you in the back that are standing up. I, believe, I don't believe either one of those. But, uh, okay, you guys can sit down. Cage, you weren't a valedictorian? Okay. Uh, how many were on the other end of the spectrum? Raise your hand. I got a six in choir for the year. How do you fail choir, right? It takes talent to fail choir, so I consider myself talented. Um, Last week, we talked about Peter and his passion during his failure. We talked about his passion. We're going back to Peter today, and we're going to talk about passion. But as we do that, I want to talk to you about a, an old uh, Jewish tradition of school. And the tradition of school was to have the dust of the rabbi. How many ever heard of the dust of the rabbi? You? A couple? All right. The dust of the rabbi simply means this, that I want to be so close to doing what the rabbi does that I will have his dust on me. Okay? So let's make an example of that. Manny, come here just a minute. So I was going to use Tim, but he's not here. Manny, come here just a minute. You're going to be my rabbi this morning. And Jason, you're going to be the student. So his job, now look at me. Yeah. His job is to mimic you. So if you climb on a chair, his job is to climb on the chair. He wants to be so close at whatever you're doing, he wants to be so close that his du your dust is on his feet. Make sense? So go be a rabbi, do something. That's a... Give him a hand. Give him a hand. Yeah, now help him get up. Um, I, got a, I got a couple of minute clips here from the movie Real Steel, if you've ever seen it. It's about a boxer, uh, but it's robot boxing, and one of those is uh, a, uh, this robot has what they call a shadow function. He'll do whatever the trainer does. So we're going to watch this for about two minutes, and then we will get on with the sermon. That's a shadow function, and it's similar to what we saw here, which you, by the way, did not follow very close to. <laughs> Have you ever wondered today what the church would look like if we simply followed Christ? If we simply followed Christ. If Christ wouldn't do this, don't do it. If Christ would do this, do that. Whatever he would do, we do. Whatever he wouldn't do, we don't do. If it was literally, he moves, we move, he doesn't move, we don't move, what would the church look like today? And I think about things like this, and I've been studying the life of Peter for more than the first or second time in my life, but I'm studying it from a passionate side this time, and I'm beginning to see things that I never saw before. And we're going to look at about a story about Peter, but he wanted to imitate Christ so very much. He wanted the dust of the rabbi on him. And I think about my own life, and I think about the life of the church today. I wonder if we ask. When we start to do something, I wonder if we ask the question, God, would you do this? And if you can't see Jesus doing it, don't do it. Would it change things? I mean, I can't see him rolling a joint. Not in the farthest reaches of my mind can I see him doing that. Let's get to the story. Matthew chapter 14, we're not going to stand today for this reason. I'm going to break it down as we go. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, beginning with verse 22. Father, bless our time together with the word. Give me strength today to be the man that you called me to be. In your precious name, amen. Matthew 14, 22, and it begins with Jesus speaking to the disciples. And it says straightway, I love that word, it's used in here more than once, straightway or immediately 
words he uses. He says, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. Now understand this. Here's what Jesus said. I command you. This is not a request. I'm telling you to get in the boat and go to the other side. I'm telling you, he constrained them. The word literally means that he forced them to do that. So he takes his 12 disciples, he puts them in a boat, he sends them to the other side. Verse 23 says, And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, or the middle of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, when you look up that word contrary, it means it was fighting them. It was literally against them like a boxer coming against you. The wind was fighting them. So get this picture. And somebody needs to hear this today. Just because you're going through hell does not mean you're out of the will of God. They were directly where God put them. They were in the center of God's will. And they were in the midst of a storm. Just because, yeah, give him praise in the house. Because when you're going through hell... When you're going through that thing that alters your life forever, that thing that is literally crushing you, fighting against you, and you go, God, where are you? You might be right where he sent you. So don't let the enemy tell you because you're going through a storm, you're out of the will of God. Somebody need to hear that this morning. Verse 25. And in the fourth watch, the last watch of the night, right before dawn of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out in fear. But straightway, immediately, Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. It's dark. The wind's howling, the waves are crashing, those 20-foot waves, if you've ever been out in the ocean with those things, it's when you come up, throw up, and it lands back on top of you because the waves are that bad. It's ugly out there. If you've ever, You know what I'm talking about, Coach. Coach almost threw up because I did. So reality, I mean, he was green looking at me. It, it can get ugly. And they were afraid. And the scripture says Jesus immediately said, don't be afraid, I'm here. Don't be afraid, I'm here. Verse 28, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Now I want you to catch this. And I've been studying this and racking my brain. Some of these men were raised with Jesus, right? Some of them, John and some of these guys were raised, but not Peter. Peter's a fisherman. Jesus came by. He's only been with Jesus for about three years, but he understands something, that he wants the dust of the rabbi. Now, let me make this clear. You know why Jesus, why Peter's a fisherman? Because he didn't make it being a rabbi. He went to school, and if he had been the valedictorian, he would have been a rabbi, but he wasn't. He was a fisherman. He was like me or maybe you. He wasn't the cream of the cream. We only got two valedictorians in the room. Everywhere the rest of us are about average. And Peter might have been like me, below average. From one story, he wasn't even a good fisherman. We fished all night and caught no fish. But Peter says to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, I want to do what you're doing. I want to follow in your footsteps. Bid me to come to you on the water. Now, if I'm Jesus at this moment in time, I got 12 disciples on that boat, and one of them stands up and says, Jesus, I want to be like you. I want to be just like you. I don't want to be like anybody else. And if I drown out there, let me drown. But I want to step where you step. And I'm thinking Jesus' heart has to be overflowing right now. Out of 12, one. But there's one. And Jesus says, come, Peter. You ever wonder why Jesus picked Peter to build the church on? 
You know, and I know what it says in Matthew 16, and I understand that it says because the Spirit revealed it to him, but why? Because Peter was so passionate about serving God that he wanted to imitate him. He was so passionate about serving Christ that he wanted to do exactly what he did. You ever wonder why we don't make disciples in the church anymore? Maybe it's because what we're doing ain't worth following. I know that stinks, don't it? But I'm talking about my life. I'm, I, I, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I would split hell wide open. And that's on a daily consensus in my brain. But I see Peter, and he says, Lord, if it's you, if it's you, I want to walk. Listen to what he says. Listen, verse 28. And Peter answered him, the only one that answered him, and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. I want a mirror image what you do. Not so that people can say I walked on water, but that I can be like you. Ephesians 5.1 says to be imitators of God. And I think Peter said, Lord, let me follow you. Verse 29, and he said, come. And Peter was come down out of the ship. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, if you've studied this out, you'll find out that I used to think Peter jumped out of the boat and took off running, right? It's really not how it happened, if I understand it correctly in the original Greek language. Peter had to climb down out of the boat. He had time to think about it. He had time to back out. He had time to meditate on what was going on in his life. But yet he climbs out, and the Scripture says the waves are crashing. They're, they're however tall. The wind is boisterous. It is fighting against them. And he looks at Jesus and said, I want to follow you. He didn't say, God, I'll follow you as long as what you do doesn't interfere with what I'm doing. He said, Lord, I want to be what you are. And then the scripture says that he went and he walked. And he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately... Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? When he come into the ship, the wind stopped. All my life, I've read this for what I thought it said. And I've studied Peter. And I literally read this for what I thought it said. Peter rebuked, Jesus rebuked Peter for, for his faith. Now what it said I don't think so. I think Jesus was overjoyed that he had enough about him to want to follow to the point where he got out of the boat. And he came walking on the water. And if I could tell it the way I believe that it was and not the way that it was translated from 4,000 years ago, I believe Jesus said, you almost made it, son. You were this close. I know you doubted a little bit, but it's going to be all right. You're the only one that could even get out of the boat and come to me. Your faith, your passion for me is the reason I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Because you want to be more like me than you want to be like you. And I'm trying to keep my personal life out of this morning. But over the last three weeks, I've taken a lot of heat for not dropping everything and running to be by my mom's side. I've had Christians, I've had pastors that said, go. Go the most important thing but you see God gave me to my mom to be her son but he called me to be a man of God after his own heart and I knew if I got there three weeks ago I'd still be there today and financially I can't afford it while I'm blessed and my needs are met I can't afford five six seven eight weeks away 
and my children can't afford it. And so we had to do what we felt like was right before God. And as bad as I want to hold her hand today or tomorrow when she leaves this earth. I want the dust of Jesus on me worse. I want you to see Christ in me through all my failures, through all my mistakes, through everything I've done wrong in my life and continue to do. I want to be like him. And when the church, I believe with everything in me that we have a church that is so hungry for God. We are on the tip of explosion. Can you imagine Christ when he looked at Peter, when Peter got out of the boat, maybe he stopped and he waited on Peter to come. Maybe he waited on Peter to come and he said, come on, you got it. Come on, baby steps. Come on. You're doing so good. You got, oh, it's okay. I got you. We'll get there. We'll get there. And I'm thinking, you know what? God looked down and he saw Peter's passion. Three years with Jesus, and he's willing to die for him. Three years, and all he wants to do is to walk on the water with him. All he wants to do is mirror Christ. And I wonder why God would use Peter so greatly. To be honest with you, the more that I study his life, I can't imagine why he wouldn't. I can't imagine why he wouldn't put him first. I couldn't imagine why Peter's feelings didn't get in the way. He just called him Satan. I still love you, Lord. Let's do this thing. And when I get people mad at me for what I've said or done, and I get this or that or that, you know what? When I have family upset with me, do I honor God? Or do I honor man? I will miss my mom as much as anybody on planet earth. But I am called of God to be who he called me to be. And I cannot let him down. I will probably be gone next week. Tending to her funeral. Or unless he changes and he raises her up. There's no work that's above him. But at the end of the day, who did I show to the world around me? The guy that puts family first or the guy that puts God first? Who do I show to the world? Who do we imitate as the body of Christ? Who, it's hot in here. Anybody else hot? <laughs> who do we imitate? Yesterday we got this news that we had to decide life or death. And I had a wedding to do here yesterday. And everything in me said, just hide in your bedroom. You can't do this. But the Spirit said, you met them on Craigslist. And the first thing they thought of when they wanted to get married a year and a half later was you. Put on your big boy pants and let's go do this. I probably was grinning more yesterday than they were. So beautiful. Eight people here, 12 maybe, I don't know. But so beautiful to see people that actually saw Christ in you. Man, there is no greater feeling. Of the thousands that don't see Christ in me every week. I want to be who God called me to be. I want his dust on me. And I am so very far away. But church, I will make you this promise today. If the body of Christ stops worrying about what the world thinks. Stops worrying about their emotions and their feelings. And puts their heart where... God is. You want to see the world turn around? 
it's not going to be won by who wins an election. It's going to be how the church serves Christ. It's going to be what we do that's going to make the difference. We are Christ to the world. And as hard as it is, and believe me, believe me, I'm going to see my family. But what I can't do is neglect everything God has called me to do for an entire season of my life. Because God has called you to do things. And he is right now speaking to someone in this room going, come on, come on. I know, I know, I know the world's going to say that your faith failed. But you're not a dry boat talker. You're a wet water walker. You were willing to get wet for me, and I'm going to use you in a mighty way. And in your heart, you're thinking, I failed him again. I can't, I can't do anything right. And he's saying, do you see what I see? Because he sees in you greatness. He sees in you victory. He sees in you overcoming. And he says, when you say, I want to do what you do, he says, come on. Come on. We got this. Come on. It's okay. Come on. Come on. Come on. The chair will hold. Come on. We got this, right? We got this. You've got this. Peter could have gave up. But all I can see is that Peter overcome. He overcome sinking. He overcome cutting a guy's ear off, so he was either lousy with a sword. <laughs> you imagine the things that Peter went through. Jesus said, "Get behind me, Satan!" And he didn't. Ta- he was talking to Peter. And then he said, "Put your, put away your sword, son. You're going to die like that. Don't do that." He said, "Peter, you're going to deny me." And yet he said to Peter. On this rock, I will build my church, the church that we are today. And I got to believe it's because one man had enough passion to jump out of a boat. One man had enough passion. And I believe with everything in me, Jesus may have been rebuking him, but it was only in teaching format. Because he wanted more than anything for Peter to succeed. And the world wants more than anything for us to fail. The world wants more than anything for us to follow our own desires above and beyond those of God. And it is time that we as the body of Christ rise up with a war cry and begin to fight for what the land that God has given us. It is time that we fight. For those lost loved ones. It's time to be good. And when they had come into the ship, the wind ceased. Verse 33, then they that were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying, of a truth thou art the Son of God. Imagine how many people are looking at your faith today. How passionate are we about our faith? How passionate are we? Are we about our Savior? How passionate. I'm truly dying inside today. But I wanted to be here with you so very, very bad. I wanted to share about Peter's victory in sinking. And let you know that God loves you so very much. That he's calling you today to walk on water. He's calling you today to rise up. And to have faith beyond measure. 
and to be a light to the world that changes everyone around you and drives the darkness away. That's the God we serve. If you haven't fallen too far, for those of you that do not know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you could accept him today and say, sweet Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And if you were real about it, you could almost say it like this. Forgive me of my sins till I mess up in a little while. And then forgive me again. And then I'm going to screw up real bad. And forgive me again. I'm going to close with this. The options they gave us yesterday weren't good. And I didn't mean to bring my mom into this. I honestly didn't. The options they gave us weren't good. And all night long, I woke up with nightmares. I dreamed our plane crashed on the way back because I had taken my mom's life. That's the garbage. And that I deserve this. And my brother laid last night and cried, God, do something. And this morning, he took the decision out of our hands. There are no options. Unless he intervenes, she's going home. I got two babies there. She's going to get to see for the first time ever. Fourteen years later, she's going to get to grab my dad and hug him. Man, what a birthday party she's going to have. in the midst of all of that I want my children to see my face I want the world to know that I love Jesus and I believe that there is enough love for God in this room to shake this city Give him praise. So I guess I'll just be one of those nuts that keeps screaming and shouting. And I'm inviting you to join me. Not to be a disciple of me. Because you don't want to do that. But to be a disciple of him. And simply ask the question, can I come with you? Walking on the water, taking my cross to Calvary. Can I get your dust on me? Can I be so close to you and follow you so close that the dust that is on me is your dust? I believe revival starts with passion in our heart. Imagine what worship would look like if 73 people in this room, whatever's here, worship him with reckless abandon. Imagine what tomorrow would look like if every decision today was what do we do next, Lord? Because I'm just going to follow you. Imagine what your neighbors would see. Father, I thank you today for Peter, the old screw up. I thank you that you love screw ups because it gives me a chance. Thank you for loving me and my stupidity and ignorance. Thank you for calling me. I don't know why you would call me. But I am so glad you did. And I pray now for this group of men and women that the calling you have on their life, whatever that is, 
that it would rise up in them with such a passion. Maybe that's just taking them to the woods and riding around with folk. Maybe that's giving a dollar to someone on the street corner. I don't know the calling in their lives, but you do. And I'm asking you to save the ones here that are lost. For those that have gotten wayward that you draw them home. For those that faith is wavering a little bit, lift them out of the water and go, I got this. I'm going to calm the sea and we're going to take the world. God, I ask you to meet needs. But more importantly than our physical needs, I'm asking you to stir our heart. To create a fire that cannot be quenched. That the world will know.